Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak. The um, topic of my conversation, the um, the ev evolutionary mismatch I present is very different from most of the other angles that I see here. It started with a um, simple question, as many things do start. It started with the question, why are teeth crooked? So I'm an orthodontist. I deal with crooked teeth. It's my profession. And I think it's very important to understand the cause, the etiology of what you're doing. And of course, science often starts with the question, why? I remember meeting a German engineer, and he was taught to ask the question, why? I think six times. But you need to ask, why, why, why? It's my favorite word. Now, we have a problem, crooked teeth, and at the moment the solution seems to be straighten them. Well, we do prefer simple answers. A concern has been that teeth don't seem to stay straight. I mean, I'd ask a poll here, how many people here are wearing retainers of some sort? So, quite a few wearing retainers of some description. So, teeth aren't staying straight. The next answer is, hold them straight. Now, the scientific evidence would suggest that this is an evolutionary disease. So, it's predominantly the environment with a sort of genetic flavor to it. And the vast weight of quality publications in peer-respected journals suggest that it's an environmental disease, or predominantly environmental disease. And yet, we seem to be treating this as if it were a genetic disease. And this is my issue. Now, there are no real alternative theories. There's no real decent alternative research. The, the image on the bottom left is taken from someone called William Prophet, his book that is the predominant textbook of orthodontics. And there he suggests a known cause of about 5%. Now, those are the syndromes, the pathologies, the diseases and other things. So you know those ones clearly and obviously. So for most children, most of you who have had orthodontics, there was no known cause. They didn't know what the problem, why the problem existed. Now, this is my Bible. It is not the easiest read, but this man Caraccini, he has spent his life researching this. And he has, there's a lot of important information there. That's where I gained, have gained a lot of interesting facts. Now, when we look at the etiology, the cause, so you don't find malocclusion present throughout our evolution until civilization. For the masses, for the average person, there was very little crooked teeth till about 250 years ago. Then you don't really see it in any of the other 5,400 species of mammals. And there's a lot of other species of mammals. I mean, we've got you know, a huge number. Of, and you can also talk about those that have been dead or extinct. Although, interestingly, you are seeing some malocclusion present in the domesticated cats and dogs. And of course, in England, we have this itch situation with cities being infested with feral foxes that live off our waste. And we're seeing crooked teeth, aka malocclusion, within these groups. Now, what we do see is this pattern. Oh, sorry, I will do first. We don't see malocclusion either or we see less malocclusion in the indigenous populations. So the indigenous populations that are alive today, and they're not living such an indigenous lifestyle. And yet there's a significant tendency for them to have less of a problem. 
this is an in ish, um, some images of Inuits. This was from War, who was a contemporary, interestingly, of Weston Price, who observed the Inuit population. And they're an interesting case, because you have a group of Inuits who, at the stroke of a pen, became Canadian citizens. They were then eligible for social housing and food stamps. And some groups chose that option. And within two, if not one generation, of a purebred sample who, until that point, had had near ideal occlusion, you got severe malocclusion, similar to the indigenous population. So that was very telling. But of course, I, I draw a graph here, and that's a logarithmic graph. Um, following you, Homo sapien, an anatomically correct Homo sapien. Now, you could probably extend, I know we've got this find in Algeria now, I, we think we can extend that back 350 or 320,000 years. But we had a fairly constant 5%, and that harks back to that pathological group, but didn't really start until we started farming. Until we went through the second epidemiological transition, we moved from subsistence, sorry, from hunter-gathering to subsistence farming. And notice these two lines I've drawn here. The yellow lines, the Industrial Revolution. So at the Industrial Revolution, malocclusion seems to pick up notably. The black line, of course, is when we took our x-ray normative data. Now that worries me, that we've got the normative data taken so recently in a disease of modern society. You can then look a little bit at the epidemiology, and I put a slide there that shows the distribution of sickle cell anemia. That's a proper genetic disease. If you have sickle cell anemia, you will be related to someone from those areas. I've heard it suggested that it could be interbreeding that's caused malocclusion. That doesn't really hold up. I mean, you can crossbreed a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. One of the canine teeth of the Great Dane weighs more than the head of the Chihuahua. <laughs> All of the offspring have a range of sizes between mother and father their teeth match. So clearly, it's not such a simple relationship. And people talk about a time change. Some of our ancestors had bigger jaws. Sorry, not our ancestors. Some of the species we evolved from. I think there's, that's about as scientific as a fairy tale, really. I don't think that cuts the ice. Now, epidemiologically, it seems that Wherever civilization has raised, has been raised, whenever civilization has raised, in complete isolation, and to whomever, regardless of their being related, malocclusion has occurred, and has occurred in proportion to the level of civilization. And you ask anthropologists and archaeologists, they'll always say, Malocclusions, a disease of modern civilization. Now, the two main factors, I think, is the reduction in muscle usage. And these experiments of nature here show a good example of how reduction in muscle usage can affect facial form in general. The slide on the right is a proper muscular dystrophy. And the template laid over the top shows how a norm would be. But remember, those were norms taken in a much more modern era. So I don't think that really relates to how the good growing ancestors were. And of course, we've had a huge change in masticatory effort. It was not unusual that in your fourth decade of life, you would wear your first molar, tooth number six, down to it broke into its roots. Now that's a lot of wear. 
And that was true right up until the medieval period. Now, posture seems to also play a large role. This young boy gained a complete blocked nose because he had a gerbil in his bedroom. And it has affected how his face has grown. And of course, Harvold has done some interesting work on monkeys. In one case, he blocked the noses to force oral respiration and gained a very similar result to that boy. But then trying to tease a little bit deeper, he simply put a sharp object in the roof of their mouth. So he's not affecting the breathing. He's not affecting the way that air goes, but he's forcing a lower tongue posture. Because the tongue quickly ulcerated from this object in the roof of the mouth, forcing a low tongue posture, and that caused equally severe malocclusion. You know, you had your control set with near ideal occlusion. You have your experimental group with severe skeletal change and dental change in every case, just from lowering the tongue. And of course, if you have to breathe out of your mouth, you're forced to lower your tongue. So in essence, what seems to have happened are muscle tone is reduced. We've gained blocked noses. So we've moved from good body posture with our mouths closed to poor posture with weak muscles. And our faces have elongated. And to give an illustration of that, if you have strong muscle tone, you're biting heavily together and your tongue's up on the roof of your mouth. Your face tends to grow forwards, like this. And you have good facial growth. What I refer to as an upswung face. If you have weak muscle tone, and your tongue is low within your mouth, stimulated by nasal obstruction, which then becomes a habit, your face is going to tend to downswing. And then, interestingly, it will reform because there's only a certain passageway that that back of the mandible can access into your head. You know, your mandible has only a certain space, a certain avenue, passing lots of vital structures. Now, this is an Australian Aboriginal compared to a good-growing modern human who has naturally straight teeth. And you see how the face is downswung. It's a little bit like all of modern humanity have had a mild bilateral stroke. Everyone here has had a mild bilateral stroke. And of course, as that occurs, the cross-sectional area reduces. You have less space for the teeth. And that you get crooked teeth, malocclusion. And depending how you respond, depending how you decide to comfortably place your tongue and mandible so that you can breathe normally will determine what type of malocclusion you get. Because it's all about breathing. It's the most important thing in most people's lives. And as the face downswings, as it lengthens, it affects your airway. This whole cross-sectional area gets compressed. And what can get compressed? Well, the easiest thing to get compressed is your airway. So you then respond in different ways. Now, so what I'm suggesting is more complex than just crooked teeth. Crooked teeth aren't happening in isolation. We're having a general change in facial form that's leading to crooked teeth. And of course, this change needs a name. You need to name things to understand things. So I've come up with the term craniofacial dystrophy. Dis, bad or wrong, trophy development. So we have bad, wrong development. Now, it's interesting. In medicine, we seem to lack theorists. We have experimenters, observation, 
experimenters, and they seem to do all the thinking. We don't have people who just think, who, you know, speculation on ideas is not encouraged in medicine. Particularly not if you come up with an idea that doesn't fit the current paradigm. It is not encouraged. I think that's a great shame. And that old phrase of prove it. Because, you know, there's not much evidence on function. It's hard to get. And posture, well, that's function over time. You know, you need to follow someone around all the time. And are they really going to act normally when you're following them around? Are they going to act normally when you've got them wired up to machines? It's a difficult thing to really study and understand. And you've got no evidence. Is not Well, no evidence is not the same as being wrong. It means you have no evidence. But my concern, of course, is a face that is not the right shape doesn't work correctly. And you can say, well, what, in, what important functions does the face do? Well, quite a few, really. And of course, the face is connected to the rest of the body. So there's probably knock-on implications from having a face that isn't the right shape. Well, certainly, if the face is downswung, the upper jaw is going to be narrower. That's going to influence the nasal airway. And we have, oh, I think I said deviant. Not, if anyone's got a deviant nasal septum, do tell me. <laughs> it should be deviated nasal septum. Wonders of spell check. Um, but of course, if you've got less space, you're going to get sinusitis. You're going to get more inflammation. And also, I think a normal level of inflammation within a narrow nasal airway is likely to lead to blockage where if you had a wider nasal airway, that normal level of inflation wouldn't have left, led to blockage. And of course, you're going to get glue air. The, if the face is truncated, it's developed less horizontally, your eustate, the opening of your eustate, eustachian tube is not going to regularly open when you swallow, as it should do, leading to what we call glue air, um, otitis media, and uh, blocked use, you know, uh, uh, the reduction of patency of the eustachian tube. And of course, you're breathing air through your mouth, not through your nose, you're going to get tonsillitis, adenoids will flare up. And of course, well, the big one really is sleep apnea and with that snoring. The most statistically significant measurement for sleep apnea is the distance from the insertion of genioglossus to the posterior pharyngeal wall, as demonstrated here. And if your face downswings, it's carrying your tongue down into your airway. Now, yeah, I know obesity is also a major factor, but there's a lot of skinny people who have got sleep apnea. And if you look at people with sleep apnea, they're downswung usually. Not always, but a significant proportion are, and a significant portion are very downswung. And of course, you could also ask, do fat people become sleep apneic? Or do sleep apneics become fat? Because if you have a bad night's sleep and you're feeling terrible, first thing you're going to reach for is those comfort foods. And if you're sleeping badly all the time, that's going to have a constant effect. Then sleep, uh, sleep apnea is highly implicated with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and of course, as some people are thinking that ADHD is sleep app, is, is a lack of sleep. You know, if you've, you've been with kids who haven't slept well, they're pretty difficult. And what do we give people with ADHD? Amphetamines. Keep them awake. Seems to work. And as I often say, if you're snoring today, you're going to get sleep out your tomorrow. You shouldn't be snoring. But if you are snoring, I've got sleep apnea, we'll give you one of these lovely devices. The ones on the top <coughs> are the cheap 
and the expensive version of holding the mandible forwards. The bottom left is a CPAP, bottom right, well this is what's called the considered the gold standard for sleep apnea treatment, moving both jaws up and forwards. Well, Newton wasn't wrong. If you're holding the mandible forwards, you're going to be pulling the maxilla backwards. And CPAP, well, that directly pulls the maxilla backwards. So these are all nice methods of slowly killing yourself. Except, of course, for our gold standard, which is really making the face upswing, making more space for the airway. That's what you're doing. You're getting an upswing in facial form. And all of that seems, I, I could probably prove most of that. But, you know, I've seen a lot of Applications. I've seen a lot of evidence that leads me to think further. And as soon as I qualified, I went to Thailand. Hard enough qualifying. Took me long enough. And I've been going back to Thailand every once in a while ever since. So the first time I went was in 93. And what I observed was how beautifully straight everyone's teeth was, were. Also, how beautiful their skin was. And as I've been going back, I've noticed that people's teeth are getting more crooked. Lots now wearing braces, a lot now wearing braces. And often those individuals have suddenly lost that beautiful skin they had. They've got acne. Now the acne seems very well localized just to the facial area. And that's always made me wonder. But then it harks back to a little bit where I'm saying, as the face downswings, what can get compressed? Well, you're going to compress the airway. Well, what else could get compressed? Well, you could compress the venous, the lymphatic drainage. And let's look at it a little bit further. And putting together a lot of other tidbits of information, I won't go into it in detail, but you've got the carotid sheath as marked by the blue arrow. And something seems to be going on at the level of that yellow arrow as the face downswings. And often it's not in people who are the most downswung. It's that sometimes in the people who are less downswung who are trying to fight it. And it would seem related to movement functions of the lower, your hindbrain. And my suggestion is that we're getting an obstruction of the venous drainage out of the hindbrain. I don't think this is causing the first three. I think it's probably just increasing the rate at which these things occur. But if the back of your brain is sitting in stagnant blood, any other form of pathology is going to be accelerated. But there's a lot of tidbits and odd bits of information that back up that multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's is related to craniofacial dystrophy. And of course, also in that carotid sheath, you've got your vagus. And we all talk about the fact modern humans are engaged in some sympathetic hyperdrive. We're all on the go all the time. Well, of course, if you're compressing your vagus, you're going to get some sympathetic hyperdrive. You're on the go. Now, the future, where's this going? Well, I gave a lecture in Philadelphia about two years ago. And I was saying to people there that I felt that 10% of people over 60 in the westernized world, we're going to die 10 years early due to sleep apnea and its consequences. And everyone said back to me, Mike, that's probably an underestimation. I think that's going to be more. Now, I've put an image up there of Spandau Ballet. 
And Spandau Ballet was a pop group in the 80s. That makes them 60 now. Now, I know they're a pop group. They're a biased group. So, yeah, they're slim. They've got good facial development. But just Google beach. Google faces. Go into a university. Start looking back at the yearbooks. Facial form was better. We seem to have... Everyone agrees we're getting fatter. But look, we're getting more downswung as well. Faces are melting down. It's occurring slowly, slowly beneath our noses. And we're not even noticing it. Now, that leads me on to the inconvenient truth. These cases were treated by orthodontic treatment. What do you think that may have done for their facial form? Upswung it or downswung it? I see this a lot. Now, we call this unfavorable facial growth. We call these people poor growers. But do you think they're going to live as long? I don't think so. Now, my father, in 1998, went on national television in the UK to say that he thought modern orthodontics was causing facial damage, notably in about 20% of patients. That got his career destroyed quite nicely. And no one ever actually sat down and asked him what his concerns were. And I see this all the time. And I think there's collateral damage. And I think these are responsible. I think these are not good for you. These are causing damage to people. Not everyone, but I think these are shortening lives. Now, if you look on the, on the web, you'll feed P talking about retractive and non-retractive orthodontics. Why? Why are they talking about this? Why are we talking about there is an issue with retractive or non-retractive orthodontics? People talking about airway orthodontics. Why were we considering about airways and orthodontics? Clearly, someone's concerned there may be a problem. Well, my problem is if you don't understand the pathology, you're likely to mess up. And almost always, roots are shortened when you have orthodontics. Almost always. Sometimes it's alarming. Now, we get long in the tooth. You can't, as you get older, you can't afford to get very long in the tooth when you don't have much length on your teeth. And if you need a root filling, well, that is going to be a lot more difficult if you've got roots like that with open ends on them. And then, who, remember those people here wearing retainers? Well, recently in Britain, we had a campaign, keep that smile. Because teeth don't stay straight. Because you don't understand why they were crooked, and you haven't fixed the problem. So we're holding teeth straight with retainers forever now. If your facial form changes, so our faces drop, as they often happen in a modern society, we don't have enough force, our faces gently lengthen. And if you're holding those, those teeth in a mechanical device that you wear every night, as the face changes, the teeth don't change. And you see how these teeth are bulging out. The bone's moved. The teeth are now outside of the bone. How long are those teeth going to last? And remember, mass orthodontics only started about 35 years ago. Anyone old enough beyond the, to remember, we didn't have kids, all these kids in braces before then. It wasn't happening. Now, that's normal occlusion. That's how our teeth looked for hundreds of thousands of years. 
all 32 teeth. Everyone who had wisdom teeth before about the medieval era from several researchers had them working in function. There's been no genetic change. There's none, this idea that we don't need them anymore. That is nonsense. If, you've had, if you don't have space for your wisdom tooth, something's wrong. I mean, I've got space for my fingers or my hands. Damn it, if my legs aren't the same length. Am I just lucky? Now, we can't go back in time, but what can we do? Now, this is what I'm doing. <coughs> and I believe I'm getting the best facial results or the best facial change ever achieved anywhere by anyone. But this is not easy. But look at that result. That boy is not going to get sleep apnea where there was a high chance he was going to. And that's upswung the face that was set back, with the jaw set back. Here we've upswung his face with the upper jaw set back. She was told by a surgeon that there was nothing they could do till she was 18 years old. How's that for consent? How would her life have been if she was growing like the picture on the left? Because that would have got a lot worse. She would have gone through her formative teenage area, era with uh, what we could call a suboptimal view. Nice improvement, but hard work. And I'm trying to extend this to an older age group, almost non-growing. He was 16 when we started. But this does not make money. The amount of time and effort I put into this is ridiculous. So I've had a 10-year campaign to gain debate on this subject. I started in 2009 with an article, The Black Swan. I've then written to the British Orthodontic Society. I've gone to the government, every department I can think of, the Minister of Health, the General Dental Council. I've set up a social media site. I mean, try typing orthotropics in. And this concept of mewing has been set up. I've, I'd have been this phenomenal success on the social media. I wasn't expecting this. I mean, it gets a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah? Uh, um, let's move on. But now, because of this, I'm getting into trouble. So the British Orthodontic Society has been through my videos with a tooth comb. They don't like them, and they've reported me to the General Dental Council. Clearly, this profession doesn't want to change. And so far, I have had no engagement at any level. I'm saying we don't know what causes the problem. We need debate. So all I'm calling for is debate. Discuss why teeth are crooked. The normal scientific process. And now I seriously risk losing my license to practice for me trying to raise debate and get information out to people in the wider community. And I face going in front of a board who all believe in the status quo, having to quote literature based on the status quo, and having to choose from a range of experts who are based their careers on the status quo. That is not a good, not good odds on staying in business. Now, what really annoys me is I think this could all be prevented. I think with good quality, hard, a tough, bulky food, I don't really know all the answers. But definitely food you have to work on to eat. Prolonged breastfeeding, baby-led weaning, if you're familiar with the concept. But also, an hour's postural exercise a day, an hour's resistance training a day. And I think that wrapped up in a personal, a public health message could minimize or eliminate all of those symptoms that I quoted to you. And the one hour chewing, just chew gum one hour a day from about three or four years old. And this one hour's exercise, well, we wrap this up with eating. 
the simple rules, sit up straight, elbows off the table, chew your food properly, swallow with your mouth closed. Not exactly new. Really, I've just re reinvented the wise tradition of stand up straight and shut your mouth. <laughs> now, on the 28th of July, I am going to start a petition in the UK, and I will ask government to ask the General Dental Council to repeat the debate of 1936 on why are teeth crooked. I need signatories. I need letters to government, and I need signatories on this petition. I need collaborators, I need volunteers, and I need donations. I want the truth, the whole truth and no dogma. And I don't have all the answers, but I am asking the right questions. And right now, I am putting my career on the line before I get it taken away. Now, if people are watching this lecture and they have kids with braces on, I'm saying get the braces off either the top or the bottom molar and premolar teeth. Because I think it's where you've got the brackets on the back teeth upset the bite. You don't want to bite as hard. And of course, that's one of the major causes. I'd say take good records. I'd say to all of you here, write something in your own field that relates to what I'm saying. But please don't put it out till the 28th. Have a small embargo till then if you can. And why am I doing this? Well, I set out on this mission when I was 14 years old. My father's been talking to me about this since I could talk. His gr he can remember where he was when his grandfather said, oh, John, I've just read an interesting book by this guy called Weston Price. It's before my father even left school. And I think I need, I want to benefit mankind. And um, we were not born to be ugly. We were not born to be unhealthy. And right now, I've, I've done it. I have worked so hard. I work 10, 12 hours a day, every day, often seven days a week. I have so, everything. I've burned a house, inheritance, everything. But I've built a clinic that is getting amazing results. But I need the spotlight of modern medicine to focus on this. In the UK, I'm a pariah. In the national health, no one talks to me. No one returns my calls. I can't get involved in science. I can't get anything. So I'm going to push for change before I die. So thank you very much. All help would be appreciated. And that's the campaign title, Why Are Teeth Crooked? Okay, well, that was kind of inspiring. Um, <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, the microphone is over there. Aaron? Mike, thanks for continuing to carry on this mission. And you've spoken at AHS before on this uh, important topic. In the US, at least, within dental anthropology, I know, for example, Peter Unger, uh, there is a recognition um, scientifically that validates the, the questions you're asking and some of the implications for why teeth are getting crooked. Now, I even know for a fact that he has had his two children to beef jerky. He gives them on a regular basis because he understands that fighting hard things is very important for a teeth, jaw, and bone and facial development. So, in anthropology, in, this, in the academic world, is sort of you know, it's a small current of people, but it's sort of accepted. What about in that field in the UK? And is there any crosstalk between uh, the British uh, uh, Society for, for Dental um, Medicine and anthropology? Well, it's, it, I think within anthropology, and Peter Unger are very clear, they, they, they follow the science. They are aware of the science, they're following the science. The science is all there. It can just be ignored. You know, the orthodontic community 
choose to ignore the science. So, uh, the, the implications as a profit uh, decision. Um, I didn't say that. Uh, implicitly, maybe. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I have a feeling they don't want to lose their incomes. They don't want to lose their status. Anybody who wants to talk to Mike over here, you have 10 minutes, but everybody else is on break. And we'll be back to okay, so if you want to come closer here, I think we have more. You're talking about lots of different methods of rearranging the deck chairs and the Titanic. That's all they're doing. They're rearranging the deck chairs when they're young. They're rearranging the deck chairs when they're old. That's it. You're not affecting the causes. Medicine is about affecting causes of the problem. That's affecting the muscle tone, that's affecting the posture. None of what you're saying is affecting either, generally. 